Please join me in this tribute to Seymour Benzer and welcome to the Distinctive Voices podium, Dr. Allison Adcock. Thank you. Well, thank you for that kind introduction and the warm round of applause. I'm, um, I'm really delighted to be here to talk with you this evening and deeply honored um, by do we have feedback by uh, the invitation? And I hope that the work uh, and the presentation that I have for you tonight will be a fitting tribute to Dr. Benzer. I never met him, but like most uh, neuroscientists working today, my work was shaped by his, even though the questions that I, uh, are, I'm pursuing are very different from the things that he worked on. And in particular, the strategy that he pioneered of perturbing the biology of the brain and examining how that affected behavior is really central to the way that, um, that I'm pursuing the answers to these questions. So thank you all. Um, so the, uh, the title of my talk is a quote from one of my mentors in psychiatry residency. Uh, and it refers to the common misconception uh, that psychotherapy and other forms of mental health intervention uh, are reducible to counseling or advice giving. And as most of us know, there's no shortage of good advice in the world, uh, and certainly in my life. And what's really needed for most people is a greater capacity to take good advice and remember the wise things that other people say and learn from life's lessons, the lessons that life offers. <laughs> um, and that is the overarching goal of work in my laboratory, to help us do that. Along the way, I think we've learned some really interesting things about um, memory and human motivation and memory systems designed to make our memories useful. So I'll start with posing some basic puzzles about memory. And the first is that it is not veridical. Memory is not a movie. It's selective and therefore inaccurate from the get-go. So everyone, I think, at one time or another, has been embroiled in an argument about who was at what dinner party in 2004, or what year the Loma Prieta earthquake interrupted the World Series, where people are pitting their uh, memories against each other. And it's clear that somebody's wrong. Uh, and the truth is that everybody is, and probably also stubborn. Um, so why is this? Uh, why is it that memory, isn't this a problem? Uh, the surprise is that uh, the thing that's most obvious to us about memory is probably not the thing that is its true biological function. OK? So what memory is for is not winning arguments or telling stories, even though that's an important thing that we use it for. It's uh, the memory system that creates these memories that seem so vivid and story-like. Uh, it, it, like other parts of the brain, is designed not only to record the past, but to predict the future and make it possible for us to respond adaptively to it. So if that's the case, then what memory needs to do to do that effectively is be selective. So it really is all about me. <laughs> it should be selective and selectively focused on things that are relevant to me. And this means that even if two humans are in the same place at the same time, they form different memories because they want different things. So if you ask these two people to report their memories of this event, chances are they would say pretty different things. And that's because, at least in part, that what matters to him at the outset is not what matters to her. <laughs> and I'll argue that this plays out in what we remember. So the, the kind of long-term memory traces that are created um, are modulated by the needs and desires of the humans. Uh, so if you ask them about uh, their memories, what he will say is very different from what she will say. And this is um, likely to cause problems. For example, if, um, if he remembers that coffee is available in the Space Needle because he had some without remembering that he brought it there um, from someplace else. So, so memory, if it's for helping us find our way around the world and um, get what we want and avoid the things that we don't want, it should be selective. This is exactly how it should be working. And so 
even though this is inconvenient, it's also adaptive. Um, so let me give you an example of how this works. In 1999, uh, I'm, <laughs> I moved from Bethany, Connecticut to San Francisco. So, so this is a pretty striking example. So we, we started across the country. We packed all of my stuff into my camper uh, top on, on top of the pickup and headed along this route. And we didn't have much time, so we stuck close to the freeway. And the coffee that we found along this route was reliably dismal. And to make things worse, my espresso maker was sitting just out of reach behind the window in the truck that showed me what was in the camper top. So I could see it there shining like a beacon. And for the next three days, I would get my cup of pale truck stop coffee and sit in the truck and look back longingly and try to pretend it was going to be OK. Until after about 2,000 miles right there, um, 2,000 miles of watered down coffee in Vail, Colorado, we passed a sign that looked something like this. Now, I don't know if you can see that little logo in the corner, <laughs> but I spotted it from a long way down the freeway. And, and then we got off at the Vale exit, and we turned left and went under the freeway and headed up a little hill to the south, and then turned right to go to the west, and found a little plaza. And to this day, all these years later, I've never been back to Vale, Colorado. And I can tell you about the layout of this city, even though there's nothing very interesting there. <laughs> right? And in fact, I remember this mental map of Vail better than I remember how to get to some objectively much more interesting and distinctive experiences like Arches National Park and a place that isn't in any park that we pulled over because the National Geographic Guide told us to and took pictures of dinosaur footprints, right? And those are somewhere in here. <laughs> right? So I have a very detailed and durable representation of a place where I expected to get something that I wanted and some other happy memories with fuzzy details. OK, now that's a nice story, but what about some data? So here's how we study spatial memory in the lab. And this is essentially a navigation video game. This pool is a featureless pool, and the object is to swim through the water to find a hidden platform. You might have guessed that this is modeled after a task for rodents, not necessarily for people, but it's very well studied, and it's really reliably dependent on a part of the brain that we're interested in. And um, it's a lot like what people call dead reckoning. Um, so you have nothing to guide you except the abstract paintings that are on the wall. And your goal is to find the submerged platform that will get you out. And the catch is, in this version, there's also a bad platform. And if you touch the, the bad platform, the trial is over. And we have several different measures of learning. We have how many times the um, participants make it to the right platform, how long they take, how long the path is. And on all these measures, if we offer people a cash prize, for good, the good platform, reward motivation improves all these different kinds of learning. Now, you might be thinking, sure, any kind of motivation improves learning. But in fact, if it turns out that if we incentivize this task in a different way by giving people a mild electric shock when they hit the bad platform, or if they take too long, it actually impairs learning, not enhances it. And here's the direct comparison. So we have, um, these are both comparisons with the unmotivated condition. So approach motivation, the reward cue, increases performance relative to no motivation. And avoidance motivation decreases performance relative to no motivation. OK? And one of the most interesting findings from this work is that we were also tracking arousal, so uh, autonomic arousal in these individuals. And even in the objectively positive condition, so the people in the shock condition, everybody gets aroused. Everybody gets nervous. In the reward condition, there are still some people that get nervous when they're doing this task. And those people who get aroused, the, this line is, uh, represents everybody as uh, individuals as dots. So the worse your performance, the more aroused you are in the reward condition. So for some people who treat the reward opportunity as though it's a threat, it interferes with their learning. OK? Now, these kinds of patterns suggest that we might need greater precision than just motivation to understand this relationship, which is true. And ultimately, I'm interested in, in 
more precisely defining these relationships, but even more interested in the biology underlying them. How does this happen? How does motivation influence memory formation? And most importantly, how can we leverage this to enhance human function in the world? And those are the questions we're working to try to answer. So intro to introduce the next set of studies, I'm going to give you a brief tour of the brain systems that we think are involved in the how question. And this is a stack of MRI images of the human brain. And here's the front of the head over here. And here's the back. And I'm going to rotate it. We're going to slide through it. And it's going to start rotating. And that cortex is going to disappear so that you can see the things that are underneath it, the ventricles and some of the machinery that's embedded underneath the cortex. And the cortex, that wrinkly covering, is the thing that most people think about when they visualize the brain. But actually, the things that are underneath it are really critically important, too, especially for memories. So now I'll flatten these uh, regions into two dimensions so that I can talk about the relationships between them. Now, the circuits that I'm highlighting have three main kinds of structure that are really consistent with their function. The wrinkly bits over here right, are patches of the cortex that you can see from the outside. And the cortex is basically just a big sheet of cells that can represent lots of different kinds of information. It has some specialized structure, but basically its function is defined by what other parts of the brain it talks to. In contrast, these things that have very definite shapes are specialized memory machines with elaborate architecture that really tightly reflects their function. And today I'm going to focus on this one, the hippocampus. And finally, there are these tiny little collections of cells that modulate the activity in the rest of the brain. And these set the gain on memory encoding. So we'll start with the memory machines, and in particular, the hippocampus. This was named by early anatomists for its resemblance to a seahorse. So it's Greek uh, for hippo, horse, and campus monster. Uh, the one on the left is the one that came out of the brain. Um, <laughs> and here is a slice of the hippocampus through the uh, crossways, so that you can see the sort of jelly roll structure of it. And this is stained using a technique called Brainbow, which stains the neurons lots of different colors so that you can see each neuron outlined. And you can see it's very beautiful, isn't it? You can see the, the individual cells in this kind of staining. And you can also see that this is made up of several different regions that are very different from each other in structure, where the, the density of the cells is different here from here and here, right? And the hippocampus is a, a great example of classical neurotransmission with a twist. In classical neurotransmission, neurons convey information to each other in a fairly specific way. So these tick marks represent action potentials. That's when the, the body of the neuron sends a ripple of current down the axon to the downstream cell. And the downstream cell integrates the incoming information and adds it up in uh, complex ways. And whether the, the, in, the incoming information stimulates action potentials in the outgoing cell depends on the kind of chemicals that these neurons use to talk to each other. So inhibitory neurotransmitters dampen the downstream cell, and excitatory transmitters increase its activity. So that if you integrate these kinds of information, here the purple neuron is integrating excitatory transmission from this neuron and inhibitory transmission from the blue neuron, which cre creates a pause in its firing. Right? So this is information going from one place to the other in the brain in a really specific way. And the twist in the hippocampus is this. The hippocampus has a lot of uh, recurrent excitatory loops. And its job is to index information in the whole rest of the brain. All the rest of the brain connects with it in one way or another and divide it into moments that it then records. Okay. And it does this with a trick of circuitry. So it sends information from A to B via two routes. And the first route goes directly there. right? And the second route takes a couple of stops along the way. So you have information that gets to be 
uh, directly and indirectly. So that region compares the information from a split second ago to the information from right now and detects differences. And if a difference is detected, it connects with all the information in the rest of the brain and makes a memory of that moment. Okay? And, but it doesn't do this indiscriminately, as I've just told you. In fact, we have evidence in my laboratory that uh, when humans are in a state of reward motivation, that the mismatch signals that the hippocampus generates when something is unpredicted are bigger, right? We also have evidence that the memories formed are stronger, and I'll tell you about that in more detail. But to understand how this happens, why it would work, we need to talk about a different kind of neurotransmission. And that is neuromodulation. Oh, boy. OK, here we go again. OK, so neuromodulators, unlike classical neurotransmitters, are more like fertilizer. They, instead of relatively precisely sending information from one neuron to another, they send it out to a huge number of downstream cells, a relatively uniform signal. And their downstream cells, and the interactions between the downstream cells, and so on. So in this way, rather than this precise transmission of information, the neuromodulatory systems, some examples of, of which are dopamine, serotonin, norepinephrine, these may sound familiar to you for various reasons, consist of centralized groups of cells that spread widely throughout the brain and set the gain of circuits and coordinate entire systems right, to work together. And this is really important because here in these systems, really small biological changes can have huge impact on the rest of the brain. And this is why these are often implicated in diseases like Parkinson's disease, depression, and schizophrenia. Okay, these are the targets of most of our psychiatric drugs. The one that we focus on in my group the most is dopamine. And like other neuromodulators, dopamine neurons project widely to the brain. But they're special because the targets uh, of their projections are uh, selectively regions that are involved in attention and memory. And in fact, we know from animal research that dopamine is necessary for long-term memory formation. If it's not at the synapse, the plasticity doesn't stay. It drifts in and is there for a little while, detectable for a little while, and goes away. Okay? So this little knob represents the dopaminergic midbrain. I'll sometimes refer to it as the ventral tegmental area, or VTA. Neuromodulatory neurons are also special, not just because they project widely divergently to the rest of the brain, but also they get convergent inputs. So they collect information from large areas of, of the brain and integrate it, a lot of different information, into a relatively uniform signal, a simple signal. So these kinds of neurons tend to respond to important or meaningful events. So what do I mean by important or meaningful events? <clears throat> things like reward cues, okay? This histogram is from uh, the primate dopaminergic midbrain, an electrophysiological recording from dopamine neurons. And these are time-locked to events in the experiment, like the delivery of a reward, which in this case is probably juice, not coffee. Uh, but notice that there's also, so you can see this, this um, cluster, this burst of, of firing. So the height of this represents how many spikes there are. This burst of activity right after a reward cue, but also this ramping up of activity around the predicted time that the reward is about to occur, right? So this is anticipation. And this is the state that we've been inducing in my lab to try to enhance memory encoding. Okay. I've used an example here from primate physiology because it's beautifully precise. You can see exactly how things are laid out. Um, but fortunately, we can see something similar in human brains without electrodes um, because changes in neuronal voltage require energy. And because they require energy, they withdraw oxygen from the blood and change blood flow. And we can detect these changes with MRI that's tuned properly. And we refer to this response. Um, the extraction of oxygen from the blood and the subsequent um, dynamic um, influx of, of oxygenated blood to that region is the hemodynamic response. And the technique that we use to detect it is functional MRI. We also sometimes uh, represent these as gradients because they're blurred responses. They're not as precise as neuronal activity. 
And here is an example um, from my laboratory of a similar response in the human dopaminergic midbrain. Here's the front of the brain, the back of the brain. Here's the blow-up section that's been extracted. This is the ventral tegmental area where the dopamine neurons live. They extend backward in the substantia nigra also. And here you can see the little bits of hippocampus on either side of it. So this is activation during the time that um, the people engaged in the task are waiting to make a motor response to get a monetary reward. So they haven't done anything, they're just preparing. Okay. And in a moment, so in this case the appetite is for winning money, for a motor response, and in a moment I'll show you a similar pattern uh, for people waiting for important, valuable information. These brain responses to reward cues vary a lot across moments in time and across individuals. I probably don't have to tell you that you don't care as much about money every moment uh, the same amount, and certainly it, it varies across individuals as well. But the fact that these uh, brain responses vary mean that we no longer have to guess about whether somebody else is motivated. We can measure their brain response to the reward cue and use it to predict later behavior, including learning. So we can see direct relationships without having to figure out whether we're motivating people or not. And this suggests that we could detect brain states that would predict memory for an image before you ever even saw it. And in fact, we can do that. And here's how we did it. So we generated uh, an experimental paradigm that was like, will this be on the test with money? Uh, we ask participants to study a set of color, color scenes, color photographs with nothing very interesting in them, and we give them a heads up prior to each one, a few seconds prior, how much we will pay them for remembering it on a test the next day. And we first did this with Stanford University students who required $5 per image in order to care. <laughs> Um, so some of them paid $5 and some paid 10 cents. Uh, and I'll use the word cue to refer to this reward cue and target to refer to the thing that they're trying to encode um, in the next few slides. So what's important about what I'm going to show you is that these bonuses didn't occur until the next day. So every, everything in the brain that's happening is about the idea of this, not a payment. Okay? It's very abstract and remote. <clears throat> Now, as you might expect, there is a significant enhancement of memory encoding for the valuable items. These are you know, modest effects, but similar to other effects in memory research. <clears throat> and this led us to the interesting question of how this would work. And was this because of a brain state that we could detect prior to encoding that was separate from the processing of the stimulus? So we went looking in dopaminergic midbrain and in hippocampus for the reasons that I've uh, told you about. And we imaged using fMRI during learning in this motivated memory task. And we assessed memory with a recognition test the next day. We showed people twice as many images as they had actually seen and asked them to pick them out of the lineup. We used the performance on the memory test to backsort the information, the imaging data that we had collected during studying. And we looked at brain activation both during the processing of the stimulus, during encoding, and during this anticipation period. Using these uh, behavioral data, we divided the imaging data into high value and low value information and broke it down further into whether or not the, uh, the participants remembered the images when they saw them the next day. Okay. So this color scheme is important in the next slide. Green is for things that were remembered. Gray is for things that were forgotten. And this is the region. This is not activation in this task. This is how we found the regions that cared about reward. We used the reward task where people are just pushing buttons. And we interrogated those regions for their relationship to memory formation. So you can see that for items that were remembered, this region was activated. The green bar is up. For items that were forgotten, this region was deactivated. The gray bar goes down, right? So this is a region that um, 
predicts memory formation for high value information, not much difference for the low value items, and it's only during the anticipation, it's not the processing of the stimulus. So this is a preparatory response. The VTA is anticipating memory formation for valuable information. If we look across subjects, there's also a relationship between the size of VTA activation, where the dopamine neurons are, and their memory performance. So people, this, here every dot is a person, people who make bigger activations in that same green-gray split make, have better memory for the valuable scenes. And you can see that there are some people that don't do that well. And fortunately for the scientists, those people are also not generating very much brain activity. So there's a tight relationship between the brain and the behavior. And finally, if we look at the coupling between the dopamine region in the VTA and we look for the whole brain, look at the whole brain for regions that correlate with this on a moment by moment basis, we see the hippocampus. So this is the long axis of the hippocampus, looking maybe less like a seahorse, and here's a blob that says this region is tightly correlated with the dopamine regions trial to trial in a way that predicts memory. Okay? So we have VTA and hippocampal activation evoked by reward cues, predicting memory for upcoming experience. So this looks a lot like a candidate signature of motivation to learn. But what about other kinds of motivation? Is reward motivation special? Um, it's one kind of motivational state, but you know, we're often motivated by punishments uh, as well as rewards, and depending on your personality, sometimes more often and more effectively. But an obvious question is um, what's different about these other states? If we use punishment, for example, if we change the paradigm so that instead of promising people rewards, we threaten them with, for forgetting uh, what happens. Do we get the same brain regions involved, the same mechanisms, the same performance? Um, so we call this the high-stakes testing paradigm. And before learning, we tell people that when they come back for their memory test the next day, if they forget the image that we've shown them, we'll give them a mild electric shock, which we demonstrate before learning. <laughs> yes. So it's important to tell you that after they finish studying and before they go home, we tell them that there will be no shocks delivered at their test. And you can imagine a couple of different reasons why we do this. <laughs> so one is so they come back, <laughs> right? <laughs> but we also, more importantly, are concerned about people worrying and stressing about this overnight, which is not uh, a manipulation of the encoding learning event. It's something different, right? So what happens when they come back? Um, right, so if we're comparing the shock to the no shock items, we see that indeed the items associated with a threat are better remembered than the items not associated with a threat. But something important here is that the overall performance in this condition is, is far lower than we saw under the reward condition. So indeed there's a difference for motivated versus unmotivated learning, but the entire um, context of learning seems to matter. Th this um, should be followed up with a direct comparison, but there's a pretty dramatic difference between performance for these studies. Oh, here's an unnecessary animation. <laughs> okay, and the neural substrates of this effect are really different. We don't see VTA activation. That's somewhere in here. Um, what we do see is activation in the amygdala that predicts memory encoding. And the amygdala is a region that's long associated with threat processing and emotion. And again, across participants, we see that this anticipatory threat response predicts memory encoding. So there is a relationship. Um, there, and the threat of shock also increases correlations between the amygdala and, again, the hippocampus. But the temporal relationship is different. So now we don't see a correlation at the time of the cue during the anticipation. We see a correlation at the time of processing the stimulus. So this is a really different biological mechanism. Yeah, we have a couple of, right. And, and this also predicts memory across individuals. Here, again, every dot is a person. So there's a relationship between this biological connection and memory performance. OK. So together, we have evidence that motivation biases memory formation, even when the actual rewards or, or punishment incentives are distant from the time of learning. We have evidence that the neural implementation of that behavioral effect happens in the moments prior to experience. 
And we have evidence that the neural architecture of motivated effects on memory is incentive specific. It's not the same for rewards and punishments. So what does this mean about how we should drive these systems to produce adaptive memories? And I would say that the first answer is it depends on what you want people to learn. If you want them to learn that an appropriate response to buses is to freeze and not go anywhere, amygdala activation and threat is probably just fine. Arousal is probably doing something really useful. If what you want them to do is gain new insights about the structure of the world around them, motivation by threats will probably backfire. Okay. <clears throat> So I would say that reward motivation accompanied by VTA activation induces a special state for hippocampal learning. But where do these VTA signals come from? I've told you that this is sort of a stupid region of the brain. There's not many neurons. It doesn't have much computational machinery. It's just collecting information from the rest of, of a huge network. So we were curious about that. And I'm going to remind you again about these regions of cortex that I'm labeling here meaning and value integrators. So to remind you, because the cortex also doesn't have much machinery, it's just a big sheet and gets its function mainly from what other regions it talks to, the reason that prefrontal cortex might be special is because it collects a lot of highly processed information. So it's not sensory cortex. It's got, um, you know, information uh, with lots of abstract relationships and lots of built up information. So you might not need it to represent the meaning of the smell of coffee. Uh, and it, you might not even need it to represent the meaning of a logo for a coffee shop if you have a really ingrained association. But you might need it for knowledge that grocery stores sometimes have coffee bars in them, even if it's not advertised, or um, the, remembering the task instructions. Um, and remembering that you have competing goals that are more remote that might limit your pursuit of a proximal goal. So interestingly, we've uh, demonstrated recently that during the motor task that I showed you before, the VTA activates uh, during the anticipatory period if and only if the prefrontal cortex also activates. So that's where it's getting its information, even in this pretty basic, simple task. The, and this prefrontal information flow offers a biological mechanism where things like a job announcement can engage motivational systems. Right? And it also offers a clear route for us to instruct behavioral activation of the midbrain and attempt to release dopamine behaviorally. So the idea that we might instruct dopamine release is an example of uh, an approach I'm calling behavioral neurostimulation, which is the, a behavioral method of brief, temporally appropriate release of neuromodulators. Now, why would we want to do this? Why pursue a behavioral approach? Why not just make better drugs? Well, the short answer to that is we are looking for better drugs all the time. But a behavioral approach would offer some really important advantages. So first, it would be temporally specific. So all the biological interventions that we have now are steady state. Their goal is um, changing an equilibrium, you know, balancing a chemical imbalance. And that's true for uh, psychiatry and neurology. <coughs> so um, this is temporally limited to the time when it would be appropriate to have dopamine in a way that we could never get with oral administration of a drug. This offers the potential for specifically enhancing some experiences, but not others. For example, enhancing learning-based therapies, which uh, is another way of saying psychotherapy. And Carrie Ressler and other people at Emory have been using plasticity-enhancing drugs to drive uh, progress in psychotherapy for PTSD for a little while now with great success. And there's no reason not to expand this uh, to the behavioral realm. And finally. The safety of this kind of approach means that it could be used very widely, so including in early stages of an illness before we really knew what was going on, so the so-called prodromes for things like schizophrenia and depression. right? So we don't want to give people drugs before we know what their illness is, but methods like this would be perfectly appropriate. So I think together these make a compelling case for trying to do this even if it seems a little bit out on a limb. 
So how would we do it? We know that uh, some people can regulate their brain activity, and in particular, they can regulate emotional brain regions pretty effectively. So maybe there are just some individuals that know how to do this. Uh, can they systematically generate the state of midbrain activation, which we assume accompanies dopamine release? What if we just ask them to get motivated? <laughs> can they systematically generate a state that we can detect? Well, we tried this. Um, using new methods that let us analyze the data that we get from the scanner really quickly, almost instantly. We can track this as it's happening, so we have a really good handle on how people are doing. And this is just to give you a sort of sense of what we're asking people to do. So here's the scanner. Here are computers that are controlling the scanner. Here are computers that are analyzing the data and presenting information to the, uh, the person inside in some cases. And here's our subject with their feet here and this tiny little screen here, and we're saying, okay, do it. Get motivated. <laughs> Just get excited. I mean, it sounds preposterous, but we ask them to do all sorts of other things in the scanner that you wouldn't think they could do, and their brains still do interesting things. So, so these are the instructions. Try to get yourself into a state of high motivation. <coughs> Tell yourself positive phrases like, you can do it. Feel free to modify these uh, and explore new ones to find the strategy that works best for you. And finally, the one that's a little odd, um, but we still tell people, encourage yourself to increase your brain signal in the dopaminergic midbrain. Um, so the, do you think this works? <laughs> <laughs> No, you don't think it works? It doesn't work, yeah. So here's what people told us they did. Th this is also interesting and, and doesn't really vary. Um, uh, well, I'll, I'll save the punchline. Uh, so they think about things like my daughter winning the lottery. Um, I imagine success standing at the top of a sand dune after a long, arduous hike. Phrases like, you can do it, you got it. You can do anything you put your mind to. And my favorite, running down a line where thousands of people were giving me high fives. <laughs> It's great, right? So, and you can see that there are different strategies, right? Some are like the coach going go, 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 which is more like that motor activation thing, and some are more affective or emotional. And the, the nice thing about this kind of approach is that we can really watch people play with these strategies to see what's more effective. Well, the, the bottom line, though, for the strategies with no feedback is uh, if we look in these regions, they can't do it. So, um, so we give them an initial run. Um, and by the way, these are all very new data, so um, you're getting it hot off the presses, uh, and we're excited. Um, so <laughs> you're like, she's excited about this, right? <laughs> so there's like, that's not greater from zero. But right, so there's test one, which is um, just try to see what happens, and then a couple of training runs. And then we have a final thing that's called test two, which might not make any sense in this uh, setting because they're all basically exactly the same kind of experience. But what if we help people activate their brain by showing them what their brain is doing? That seems to make a difference. So we give people the same task instructions. You've seen these already. Uh, and we, this time we give them feedback about how well they're doing. And we give them all kinds of metrics and benchmarks. And we give them a dynamic movie that says, this is what's going on in your midbrain while you're trying to activate it. So the arrows are the signals that say, OK, go, activate your midbrain. And the thermometer is whether it's activating. So they also have some, con some blocks uh, interspersed in between where we give them rest and uh, another block where they're watching something happen similar to the thermometer, but we tell them explicitly that it doesn't represent brain activation. OK, so it looks like, so these are 14 subjects. If we give people the feedback about what strategies are effective versus not effective, they actually get better at increasing activation in their midbrain. So this is the test run. It's not significantly different from zero. They get a little better over the course of training, and they retain some of this ability when we take the feedback away. Yep. I didn't believe it would work. But OK, so, so we can't say this is releasing dopamine. fMRI doesn't tell us about that. But we can follow up on these kinds of um, results by using PET and other methods that will tell us directly whether dopamine is being released with this method. Um, but what is clear is that participants are intentionally activating their dopaminergic midbrain. And if you recall, that's the measure that we use to predict memory formation in the motivated memory task. So we may not need to know what specifically is happening in terms of the neurotransmitters if we're just driving this system. 
in order to increase hippocampal function. So that's one of the things that's exciting about it for us. There's the sort of side question of, is this uh, an alternate pharmacotherapy uh, that crops up out of this basic question of how do we drive the hippocampus to work better? And this is exciting for a few reasons. So I've told you that the hippocampus isn't just about memory. And here are some other things that it's really clearly good for. Anticipating the future, envisioning the future, and this is not just about planning or figuring out what's going to happen, it's also about having an affective relationship with the future, right? So this is highly relevant to um, illnesses like depression. Learning from delayed outcomes requires a memory of what happened that goes beyond you hit your knee and it hurts. It, if uh, you need your hippocampus to tell you why your bank account is empty when you spent all your money a week ago. Right? So those kinds of relationships and learning from them require a long-term memory structure like the hippocampus. We also need it to make choices that we've never made before, because if you haven't made the choice before, you don't have any kind of habit system to rely on. And it establishes the contexts that are appropriate for habits to continue or to cease. So it's OK to do this versus things have changed and you're not in Kansas anymore. In other words, the hippocampus is a memory system that should catalyze rapid behavioral change. And as a psychiatrist, this is one of the reasons that I'm very interested in, it in how it works. So this brings me back to an old joke that people like to tell about psychotherapy that contains, I think, our basic challenge. How many psychiatrists does it take to change a light bulb? Does anybody know the answer? It has to want to change. <laughs> yeah. So maybe our work will help us understand how to domesticate this motivation or even curiosity. Um, and this brings me to my final point, which I'm also disguising as a joke, but I actually think it's very important. Um, so here's good shrink, bad shrink. And the good shrink says, face your demons. And the bad shrink says, oh, take a pill. <laughs> and, and we have a tendency to dichotomize these approaches to treating behavioral um, problems of various sorts. And this exists both among clinicians and among our patients. But in fact, it is not either or. The best practice is not either or. Where over and over again, we see that medicine alone is not enough. People do better when they learn how to adapt to their changing environment. And most of the time, what we're doing with our medicines is making it possible for people to learn. Right? Unfortunately, uh, our biological interventions that we have, everybody knows that they're not as specific or as effective as we'd like them to be. Um, but nobody should think that I'm suggesting that anybody stop taking medication uh, because we, it's the best we got right now. But psychiatry, neurology, all of the uh, allied fields concerned with brain function are <laughs> well positioned to build on our increasing understanding of these circuits and the way they change with behavioral contexts. We can use drugs that increase neuroplasticity, including growth factors and uh, classical neurotransmitter agonists. We can use dopamine, which I've told you is essential for lasting plasticity. You may already be familiar with deep brain stimulation for uh, illnesses like Parkinson's disease and depression. These directly stimulate the kinds of neuromodulatory systems that I've told you about, but obviously they require electrodes in the head. So they are not going to be widely applied unless people are really sick. Nevertheless, we have other methods for stimulating these circuits directly, including uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation. And I hope I've convinced you that it is realistic to think about behavioral methods of attacking these uh, circuits and changing them and bending them to our will um, the, the way that scientists like to do. Um, but I think we can it, then translate that approach to something more flexible and more like therapy, even though the things that I've shown you are really not that. They're really experiments. So neuroscience has really moved us well beyond the view of the brain as a bag full of receptors and, and chemicals that needs to be balanced. Uh, and fortunately, our interventions are starting to follow suit with important and interesting implications for how we think about learning and memory. Um, and that is my message. So these are the people that I have to thank for this work, including my funding sources uh, and, and your tax dollars at work. And I thank you for your time and listening, and I'm eager to hear your questions. <laughs>